Hello YouTube, welcome to a new video. It's been a while since I uploaded to my channel and uh, there have been many reasons for that but I thought it's time for a change of direction. Anyway, we're starting off in mid-2024 towards the end of the summer with a new video where I'll talk about my PC building adventure, what I decided to build, the setup and components I'm using, and the games I'm playing and what I'm using the computer for. So without further ado, let's jump in. Okay, this is my current PC setup. Here we have a very familiar looking case you'll probably see. This is the Lian Li uh, Dynamic Evo. I went with the Harbor Gray because it has slightly darker tinted glass and I like the contrast between the, the black darker glass panels and the actual uh, gray metal exterior. I think it gives a nice contrast and the combination I quite like. If we talk about components in this system, I have to excuse the glass reflection and I have for my main CPU an AMD 7800X3D. This seems to be one of the best CPUs for gaming performance. Up there with the Intel uh, i9 14900K and 13900K, but uh, as you've probably seen in the media, there are some issues with some Intels at the moment, but anyway, we're not gonna discuss that here. Uh, I spent quite a lot of time kind of researching and deciding between going for an Intel or AMD based system. Uh, ultimately, I decided the AM5 platform being newly released towards the end of uh, 2022, offered me better longevity and upgrade paths for the future. So that was one of the main reasons. But obviously with recent developments, I'm, I feel more confident in my choice than ever before. Um, on top of the CPU, we have an AIO cooler uh, block. This is the Lian Li Galahad 2 LCD. It has a 360 AIO on the, uh, sorry, a 360 uh, radiator on the top. This has the SL uh, Infinity fans. Uh, originally, I wanted to um, populate the case with the reverse blades, but at the time they were out of stock, so I settled for the standard ones, and I think they still look good. You just don't have the mirror reflections like you do on the uh, top fans, if you can see that. Anyway, for my RAM, uh, I originally started off with Corsair Titanium, uh, Dominator Titanium. Uh, I had four sticks of 16 gig, but as a lot of people probably already know, AM5 has issues running four sticks. So I did end up buying uh, two 32 gig sticks of Kingston Fury Renegade. Uh, the pricing was good. This is at 6,400 and it runs fine. The sweet spot is CL36000, which was my uh, Corsair memory, but this is CL32-6400 and it's, it's been running well for the last, few, uh, last month since I've had it installed. Now we get to the GPU. Now for the longest time, I expected that I was going to build an all AMD system. I had pretty much decided that I would uh, put in uh, what is it, 7900 XTX, either the uh, Sapphire or the Red Devil Mo Red Sapphire Nitro or the Red Devil model. Uh, I didn't really want to spend the extra going for an RTX 4090, but in one day in January, I was still deciding, getting ready to push go, had a beer one evening, and for whatever reason, I brought. MSI RTX 4090, uh, the Supreme X model. Uh, do I have any regrets? No. I mean, it probably was like 700 euros more than what I would have spent on a, on a 7900 XTX, but uh, um, ultimately I'm happy with the decision. I think it will you know, give me many years of use before having to upgrade. 
Uh, if we talk about the motherboard now, we probably should have already talked about that, but uh, this was probably one of the first components I brought for the system. Uh, I started buying, I think in July or, yeah, sometime in July last year, uh, I initiated this idea of building a PC project, so I, I brought the motherboard in the case first. So, um, motherboard I went with was the Asus uh, X670E Hero. Uh, generally, it's been a, a good board. I uh, haven't had any issues with it. Just some uh, some stability with the RAM, trying to tweak configurations. But I think from all the testing I've done, this is probably more to do with my CPU uh, than anything else. Uh, there's a lot of guides about optimizing the 7800X3D and other 7000 series CPUs. And a lot of this is to do with uh, Curve Optimizer, curve optimizer you know, using Power Boost, uh, Precision Boost Overdrive and uh, setting a negative offset on the CPU. Basically what this means is it undervolts the CPU, uh, enabling you to reach the higher boost clock speeds but using lower voltage so ultimately reducing power usage and heat output. Uh, initially I had some success uh, testing at level 30 but when I'd ever run uh, benchmarks or stress tests then it would crash. Uh, the, the best stable profile I can achieve is a uh, negative 15 which is okay I mean some people have CPUs that will reach negative 15 uh, negative 30, sorry, but this is, uh, I guess, down to Silicon Lottery. So each CPU will be different. So I just pause the video there while I got some water. But as I was saying, yes, uh, stable configuration for this seems to be a negative offset of minus 15. Haven't had any issues with any of the stress tests, any uh, any playing games or doing uh, other tasks on the PC. Seems to be pretty stable here. Now, as you'll see on the desk, <coughs> my system is not just the PC, but there are obviously other peripherals and components that make up the system as a whole. So we'll just kind of kind of touch on these. So for my monitor. I brought this before I actually started building the PC. Um, when I got back into gaming at the end of 2022, I brought an Xbox uh, Series X, uh, and I was originally using this on the uh, the big screen TV I have behind. This is a 75 inch QNET uh, 91, and uh, great TV. It supports AMD FreeSync, has a 120 hertz 4K display. Supports Dolby Vision, uh, works perfectly with Xbox Series X. Um, but I decided that I wanted a smaller screen. If I wanted to play competitive FPS like Warzone uh, and games like this, then um, it seemed to me that maybe a monitor would be the best option. So I spent quite a lot of time looking at monitors, uh, trying to decide what screen size would be good because it I wanted to have something that would also be good for working from home, not just for kind of entertainment purposes. So I settled on a 32 inch. Now I didn't go 4K, I actually went 1440. So this uh, actual monitor here is LG, I think, uh, 32 GQ850. Uh, this is a 240 hertz uh, 1440p display. It actually has uh, HDMI 2.1 support built in, so it can actually run the full 240 hertz even at 4K, but it will downscale to 1440p. But what this does mean for 1440 resolu uh, 1440 p resolution, that it can, for uh, it can support 10-bit uh, color. Uh, I have some links uh, which I will share in the YouTube description of some of the uh, the products here that I will mention and go through as part of this video. Uh, so this is the, the monitor. It has actually been discontinued recently, but it is a great screen. I've been very happy with it. And in fact, recently, a few months back, I did uh, try out one of the LG 27-inch OLED panels, the new, uh, I think, uh, 27 
GS uh, 95. So the GS is the so thing with uh, LG naming convention is that the the first two letters are related to the year. So GQ was 2022. GR, for example, is 2023 and GS any any models with GS in the name will be relating to uh, monitors that were released in 2024 anyway it's been a great monitor uh, the thing I didn't like even about the newest LG uh, was just the brightness you had to run the brightness up max to make it even feel comparable um, I just like the fact that this IPS panel gets so much brighter. I can use it more uh, in more environment, different environmental conditions, different lighting conditions, let's say. So it suits me better. I think if we look at the reviews and all the data on OLEDs at the moment, then their max brightness is around you know 260, 270 nits for SDR content, and that's with max brightness. I just felt a little bit uncomfortable that maybe running it at full brightness will onset burning and if i'm using it for mixed productivity and entertainment usage then i will see the negative impacts of that quicker so again for me i think i need to wait a little bit longer before i jump on the oled bandwagon i mean i definitely like the screen uh, the, the performance is great i just i felt it wasn't the right time to jump in uh, the other screen that interests me actually is the 32 inch OLED where I think it's the 32 inch, uh, the 32 GS 95, I might be mistaken, but anyway, it's the LG one that actually has the dual switching. So you can switch from 4K 240 Hertz down to 1080p uh, at uh, 480 Hertz. So this could, could be an interesting screen, but I think again, the brightness levels are the same. But anyway, quickly, let's jump into some of the the, just the pages. So this was the case. The 011 Dynamic Evo from Lian Li. The motherboard again. The Asus ROG Crosshair X670 Hero. The processor AMD Ryzen 7800X3D. And a graphics card. The MSI Supreme X 4090. Kingston Memory. Kingston Fury Renegade. DDR5, uh, 6,400 mega transfers. And then for, actually, I don't think I mentioned this, actually, for my primary and uh, secondary SSDs, I'm using Kingston Fury, uh, two terabyte drives. So I've got four terabytes in the system. I had originally looked at the uh, Lexar NM790, uh, but these came late, so I decided not to use them in the end. Uh, I built the system with the Furies instead, and I've recently sold the, the drives I didn't use. Uh, then for the AIO, I'm using the uh, Galahad uh, LCD version, 360 radiator with the Infinity ESL fans. And uh, let's talk a bit more about some of the peripherals here. Then uh, for my controller, I was originally using, uh, when I was had the Xbox, I was using Xbox Series Elite, but it did break down. So I did send it back. I tried a number of different uh, controllers as well. I used uh, for a little while the Scuff Master X series, but uh, the sticks started behaving erratic. I, I still have that controller. Uh, I probably need to send it in for RMA actually. It's kind of just been dormant in a box for ages. Um, but again, it was great at the beginning, but the stick started to fail uh, quite quickly, which was a disappointing fact, but response time and everything was nice. Uh, ultimately, uh, I decided to go for the scuff in Vision Pro. Uh, I really like the fact that this has uh, the back pedals it makes uh, jump and crouch much easier and also assigning the uh, top buttons to ping so you can ping enemies. Originally I was uh, assigning the side buttons to ping but um, for me it's harder to get into, uh, into a way of using those consistently. So I've kind of changed the input scheme. But anyway, I've been uh, using this now probably for about four, 
or months or so, and I've definitely found it better. The best one I've used so far. The only downside with this controller is that it uses traditional thumb sticks, it doesn't have horn effect sticks, so there is the potential for these to wear out over time and get stick drift. But again, it is what it is. Maybe uh, version two will come out. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people are talking about Fly Digi Apex 4 controller at the moment being really, really good. I think you can pick it up on AliExpress for under a hundred dollars or under a hundred euros. Uh, I might at some point in the future give that a try. I don't know if I can get find one at a really good price. Then, then maybe. But I'm I'm very happy with this at the moment, so I see no no need to to buy additional hardware that just for the sake of it. But I would be interested to try all of sticks just to see how they compare. But the sticks on this have been very, very good, very accurate. I've been happy with it and uh, I don't have any regrets purchasing it. It is an expensive controller at around $190. So, there, so if you're thinking about this, maybe something like the Fly Digi is a better alternative if you want to save some money. But uh, I, I do recommend uh, the Scuff. It has a lot of programmable features. You also have these G keys. I don't really use them, uh, to be honest. I'm more about the paddles on the back, and I do like the, the fact that we have the side paddles, uh, side buttons. Sorry, uh, but I think one of the killer features with any of these custom controllers is the fact that you have these uh, digital tap triggers. These can be switched on and off by switch at the back, but they are really responsive and they make firing and uh, aiming down sight so much quicker. Uh, anyway, that's kind of enough about the controller. I don't want to go too much in depth. Uh, but the one thing I will say is that uh, it is wireless. The Envision, so there's two versions. You've got the Envision and then the Envision Pro. So the Envision, I believe, has some, it uh, doesn't have wireless support, so it's cabled only. And it doesn't have the rubber grip. There are a few, thi few other things it doesn't have. I'm not quite sure about looking at the detail, but anyway. I uh, ultimately went for the Pro because I wanted the rubber grip and I wanted the fact that maybe I would use wireless if I, if, if I so choose in the future, but I don't use it. I'm purely cabled. I just want to have the lowest latency possible. So that's the reason why I went with that. Uh, also keyboard. Then we have the Rocat uh, Vulcan 120. And for the mouse, I have the Krona Pro Air. Now... I, I found a really good deal on the uh, Rocat website, uh, I think, I don't know, about six or eight months ago when I bought these. Maybe, actually, it was longer, I think, maybe a year almost now. Possibly, I've had these. But anyway, there was, uh, on the European website, there was uh, US packaging versions which were heavily discounted. I think this was, like, normally, a, like, $180 keyboard and a $100 mouse. And I literally picked up both of them brand new boxed straight from Rocat for like 100 euros so excellent deal I mean I'm not a keyboard or mouse player I have tried experimented playing Call of Duty with it but it, it will take a lot of practice and time to kind of get used to doing that so I don't think that is for me at this time but anyway it's nice just to have a decent keyboard or mouse to go with the rest of the system just to kind of keep the standards there uh, you'll see some other things on my desk uh, microphone headphones and this little box here so um, I have two headphone options so when it's not too hot I like to wear the over ears uh, and uh, I'm using Sennheiser these are uh, HD 660s these are open back and I sound they have very good open sound stage very clear I really like them. Um, these are actually powered by an external deck. This is the Philo uh, K11. So for the longest time I was using internal sound card of the uh, Asus board and it is very good, but I just decided that I wanted to run some high-end headphones and I wanted to power them with an external deck. So after doing a lot of research, the uh, Philo K11 is very well regarded. It's very cost effective as well. It's around about $130 to buy uh, for what you get in this package. Its capability has a balanced uh, balanced output as well as regular output as well. So 
If you're into audio, then you can do a bit of research. I'm not going to explain all of that in this video. This is really just a kind of overview of my system and just some of the components I'm using, uh, all of which I will share links in the video description. So you can check out and dig in a bit deeper if you wish. Uh, but that basically uh, will run the Sennheiser headphones. Uh, but also, I'm also running some IEMs, in-ear monitors. Now these are the Crinical Zero Reds. So any of you that are into audio may have heard of Crinical. He's a famous YouTube reviewer. Uh, he's also done a number of collaborations with uh, uh, audio manufacturers, uh, predominantly of the Chi-Fi origin. So Chi-Fi basically is the abbreviation for you know, well-regarded Chinese manufacturers of uh, cost-effective or, or, and high-end. Uh, audio equipment so these have been very good uh, in the summertime then I find running IEMs is probably preferred because you just generally you keep a lot cooler you don't have the the uh, the ear pads of uh, over over ear headphone causing heat build up and sweat uh, although what I have seen actually coming from closed uh, closed back headphones like before I actually brought the Sennheisers I was running a Logitech uh, X, uh, was it X2 Pro uh, Lightspeed headset, uh, which closed back, sounded very good, but I did notice that my ears would heat up quite a bit with this. So these are definitely uh, definitely better, uh, open it, open back. Also do give you wider sound stage compared to closed back, but you know, everybody has their own preference. So you have to kind of try and see what works best for you. You know, I, I've tested many headsets over the years and I've just, I've, I've settled on these. They are more expensive than all of you kind of average, uh, even high end gaming headsets, but uh, you know, you got you're gonna find what works right for you. There are loads of great headsets out there, uh, so just do a bit of research, do some testing if you can. If you can go into a shop, try on a pair, see how comfortable they are, how they sound, then this is the best option. For the microphone, uh, I managed to get this uh, recently, secondhand, uh, in, in like new condition. This is the the Rode Mini, and. Uh, this also has a built-in DAC, and this actually will power my uh, IEMs, which is great. So if I don't have the DAC switched on, then Windows will auto -re automatically recognize the road device and the output will come from these. If, as soon as I switch the DAC on, then Windows automatically will recognize that and uh, output will come from these headphones. So it's great, I don't actually have to mess around in system settings. One thing I have enabled recently though is, um, Uh, what's it called? Audio equalization. Uh, I've probably got the name wrong, actually. Let's quickly have a look. Uh, let's go into control panel. We will go into sound settings. Yeah, enhancements. Yeah, loudness equalization. Now, so if you're playing Call of Duty, then a lot of people swear by this. Uh, I know a lot of streamers are using this. It does it does level out the sound. So basically what loudness EQ will do is it will tone down loud sounds uh, and and bring up the volume of lower sounds. So it pro its primary function is to balance everything out. Uh, now there's additional setting in here and this is called uh, release time. So a lot of people are trying to understand what release time does, but basically it speeds up the processing in which time, in, in, in which this function uh, levels out the sound. So if you have it on short, then it will be more aggressive at leveling out those sounds and it will do a much better job for uh, hearing footsteps, basically. Uh, Metaphor re uh, released a recent video on this uh, and he did talk about loudness EQ and uh, apparently this setting is supposed to be the best. You know, I've had mixed results. Sometimes I like it a little bit less. I feel like the positioning or the positioning is better. Uh, it all depends on how people hear and perceive sounds though. But I think when you have it lower, there is a negative effect as well. Sometimes you won't hear someone creeping up on you because it's not leveling up those, those quiet sounds quick enough. So I think overall short is better. 
but in certain scenarios, having it slightly lower here or here, for example, may be better for you. Uh, but uh, in close-up gunfights, then short probably is better. You, you're less likely to get sneaked upon from behind. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly cover that. Uh, this is the page on the K11 audio DAC. Uh, and uh, also web links for the Sennheisers. And the Truth here, uh, the True Ear uh, Clinical Zero Red. Uh, the Rode mic. The Rocat mouse and keyboard. So, you know, that's kind of basically an overview of the system. Uh, but also, there are some other things that kind of help uh, with performance here. So, I mean, obviously, having a decent modem or router helps. So, for me, I'm using the uh, U Unify uh, Cloud Gateway Ultra from U Ubiquity. Now this basically does all of my routing, firewall security, but also it does uh, smart queues. So it's smart queues is a form of uh, traffic management, which helps priority of packets. And, and basically what it does is if your bandwidth on your internet gets saturated, then it, it basically tries to manage that and stops uh, buffering. So you'll probably see a number of guides. They talk about buffer bloat and how this can affect gaming performance. So if we quickly go on to buffer bloat page, we can uh, do a test to actually see how the internet performance is. I can hear my wife in the other room. She's watching some videos on YouTube. Uh, so I will run a test now. What we're looking for is an A or A plus really to get the best performance. So what it does is it does a test, checks your unloaded latency. What this means is when there's nothing running on the line, what's the, what's the standard latency? And then what, what it will do is it will do a download and an upload test and it will see if any additional load is added. So we can see that the uh, test is going. Now we're getting between zero and one millisecond of latency. And this will finish up shortly and then it will do the upload. Okay, so overall zero milliseconds. And we can see on these other uh, percentiles here, we can see the amount of jitter. So the amount of jitter unloaded is 0 0.5 milliseconds, which is pretty good. And actually even on the uh, download loaded, it's 0 0.7. So that's really, really low. Um, but then I do have very good connection here. I have Telia and Fiber. Um, so we have Ethernet directly into the property and I have 500 megabits up and down symmetrical lines, so it's very good. Uh, so the upload jitter, 1.1 milliseconds, still very low. Uh, I mean, you know, these results can fluctuate, obviously, you know, conditions of the internet and then the wider network outside of your control is very dynamic, so it will change. but. Did these results remain consistent? I'm usually A plus all the time. And as you can see here, then we have ticks in the boxes for low latency gaming. So this is quite important. And uh, especially if you're playing any kind of competitive FPS or, or other kind of games where latency and uh, responsiveness is key. Anyway, we'll cut it there. Uh, in the next video, I'll go through some settings of the system, how I've kind of configured it, what I've done, and maybe some of the testing also that I've found trying different settings uh, in Warzone, which is the main FPS uh, title I'm playing at the moment. Anyway, thanks for now, and I'll check in again soon.